Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part 38 of the ongoing X231 restoration series and today I would like to finalize the installation of both main gear set shafts in the transmission here but in order to do that I'm going to have to come back over here to the bench and I'm going to have to pull one more piece off of this rather still complicated looking assembly. I need to overhaul this center bearing housing slash one-way clutch assembly that goes in between the torque amplifier planetary and that upper sliding gear shaft. Reason being this bearing race back here is what supports the front of this top shaft. So I'm going to get into this. We'll do a little bit of the comparison uh, contrast with the production versions. Uh, everything's pretty much the same here, but I'll get it apart, see what I'm going to need to do to fix it and see if I can reuse it. So to begin looking at this piece, the first thing I'm going to do is just get this race right out of here. I would pulled it out earlier to get the number, Temkin 352, so we're good there. Got a new one of those waiting to go back in. So like I said before, this really isn't any different from the production versions. And luckily, I've got a couple other production ones here that I can use for parts. Um, you always find problems in these things, so I have plenty on hand anticipating such. Um, as far as a number, all I see on this one, and I'm not even sure I can make it show through on the camera, is a very faint hand-scribed 10X8833. I don't know if you can see that or not, I can barely see it, but that is what's on here, and it looks like it suffered some rough treatment before, like they've been pounding some screwdrivers in there, trying to wedge these halves apart. Usually these halves split relatively easily, but uh, no numbers to find on the production versions, but basically everything looks the same. Let's see if we can find probably the best example that I've got. Set them side by side. We have oil feed holes in the same spot on the front, as well as the back. Diameters are the same. Offsets are the same. Pretty much dimensions all over are the same. Really no differences between the prototype and the production versions. So to get a bit further into this, you can see in here we have this Hyatt roller bearing and there is a race for it that is pressed in there as well. Compare that with one of my other production ones. Even though this uh, race is still in here, you can see that same Hyatt roller bearing inside there. And so far, this has been unavailable anywhere. I can't find one of these any place, and I'm usually pretty well connected, and I have not had any luck. But of the three I have here, I'm going to pick the one that I like the best and go with that. None of them look really bad. Flip it over here, and this is what's left of a Torrington needle-style bearing. You can see all the needles came out. That's what all these are right here. They used to be inside this race. Pretty much all of that stuff fell right out when we took this apart. I have an intact bearing still in this other hub, but that's not a big deal because I was able to find a brand new one. So we're good there. I can just rip the rest of that uh, empty cage out and we should be fine. Flipping it over again, you can see what is called the cam cage inside here. It's a series of little ramps and compartments that are meant to hold small rollers and springs, which these are completely flat and shot. The rollers have been horrendously worn and flat spotted. There aren't any good aspects left of any of these, and that's Pretty much how those one-way clutch pieces came out of this one, just like that as well, all in pieces. Luckily, I have very good examples of rollers, springs, uh, little flat keepers, everything I should need to get one of those uh, one-way clutches fixed back up, so we're pretty much covered there. Now to get these halves split and see what I have left to work with, see what condition uh, this is in on the inside. And I mentioned earlier it's had some rather rough treatment. Looks like people have been trying to pound screwdrivers in there before. These usually don't come apart that bad. The only thing you have to make note of is make sure both of your oil feed holes end up lined up with each other and you'll be just fine. No need to really go out of your way to index mark anything. 
Yeah, I got it opening up a bit, but boy, this one has been a lot tighter than any of the productions I've ever had apart. I got it now. Oh yeah, and we've still got that nasty black grease in there. That whole transmission rear end was just full of that stuff, and I thought I'd left all that back in 2007. Okay, so I've spent some time cleaning these up. I got all that black grime off. And once again, I'm afraid it's worst case scenario. Um, I have nothing good to report here. Once I got all of that grease off, I looked at the cam ramps. See if I can show you here. These are as worn as I've ever seen any one of these. And I'm not, not just talking about tractors. Um, they use these uh, same style one-way uh, overrunning clutches and automatic transmissions that I've been rebuilding for about the last 20 years. And I've never seen anything that's worn as bad as the cam ramps in this, uh, this housing right here. Uh, those old rollers had just uh, burnished in, created big grooves. Um, guys, I, I don't even need to try and put this together to know that it's absolute junk. It's not going to work. Um, probably the best way to show you what I'm talking about is by using some of my production pieces and actually putting together a good uh, overrunning clutch and showing you how the thing works. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that, but once again, I'm disappointed. It's uh, it's more 10X prototype pieces that are just not usable. They're, it's just too far gone, and I'm gonna have to fall back on my good production pieces for replacements. Um, starting to sound like a broken record, but it's the only way I'm gonna do this and not cause myself more problems. So I have my good one-way clutch assembly all put together. This is um, a cam cage from one of the production units that I had that is in very, very good condition. All of my new rollers, springs, and keepers are in place in here. And here is the 10X one, of course, that was worn uh, beyond use. We'll use him for some demonstration purposes still. And this hub that I placed in here, that is the removable rear hub from another uh, torque amplifier planetary unit is just this piece right here. So I've got the hub in there in the one-way clutch to demonstrate how it's going to work. Now the way these one-way clutches work is these rollers basically create a controlled bind between the planetary hub and the cam cage. I'll use the 10X one for demonstration because it's easier to see. You can see these cam ramps start out deep and they get shallower as they go up. So with the roller in place, on the cam ramp and the spring back here exerting force on the little uh, keeper that I call it. It's pushing these rollers up that cam ramp into a tighter and tighter position between the ramp and the hub. Now with the torque amplifier in high range, this planetary hub is going to want to rotate against the spring tension that's being exerted upon those rollers. It then pushes those rollers down those cam ramps into the deeper portions further compressing those springs and it allows for free rotation between the hub and the cam cage. 
Now when the torque amplifier is set to the low range position, the planetary gear set becomes active and this hub no longer wants to turn against spring tension on the rollers, it wants to go back the other way. Well, those springs now are able to push those rollers up the cam ramps to a shallower position and wedge each one of them between the cam cage and the planetary hub. That change in direction causes this planetary hub to be an absolute bind with the cam cage. And then when the operator chooses to reset the torque amplifier back to the high range position, it is going to lock that planetary gear set up, this hub is going to want to change direction, and it immediately unlocks from the cam cage. So that is how this one-way clutch system works. It's basically a very finely controlled bind between two components. So although the operation of that clutch is actually pretty straightforward, it's really quite difficult to keep one of those working in one of these tractors. And in fact, in the Minneapolis Million, when the high-low range quits working, nine times out of 10, it's because of that one-way clutch. The rest of that torque amplifier system is pretty well bulletproof. But the problem with that one-way clutch is Every component in that system needs to be in absolute, like brand new condition for it, not only to work, but work reliably. When you start getting any kind of wear on the cam ramps, any kind of wear on the rollers, any flat spotting, any kind of wear on the hub, you start having problems and that clutch will not lock up. If you start having profound amounts of wear, like is uh, on these 10X pieces or horrible flat spots on the rollers or collapsed springs, that's when this clutch will basically start destroying itself and you pull pieces like this out when you go to take that apart. So hopefully this rather long-winded explanation and demonstration settles any doubts as to why I once again have to discard the completely worn out 10X prototype pieces and substitute in good production ones as well. I mean, if I had tried to build this clutch in this cam cage, it just would have been asking for problems and it likely would have destroyed itself in short order. So now that I have a good bearing housing slash one-way clutch assembly picked out, I can start pressing those bearings and races into this thing, get this thing assembled, and then maybe hopefully transition back to that transmission. So I think I'm going to start by pressing the new Torrington bearing into the front half of the housing. It's looking good. Quite a bit of writing back here. <laughs> Not to be used in helicopter or nuclear applications. We're good. Okay, now that that's done, start working on assembling the cam cage. Very important step, you want to put that Hyatt roller bearing in right now because it's going to be captured beneath the new 352 race that's going in right on top of it. And now you can see why that Hyatt bearing has to go in before that race is pressed in on top of it. It's pretty well captured in there, so very important to get that in first. And that's the final bit of assembly for these two pieces. Last uh, item I want to talk about is this um, hardened washer. It goes in here and acts kind of as a backup stop for those uh, cam rollers and springs. And I tell you what guys, X231's original washer is actually in better shape than the one that came out of here and dimensions, thicknesses, diameters, everything are absolutely the same. So to let X231 live on in this assembly, we're using her old washer. Call me crazy, but I can say that, well, it still has original pieces. I just replaced a few of the bad ones around it, right? And for now, all the good cam roller springs keepers are going to remain out of the cage. Uh, you'll learn why in the future, but for what I need to do with this now, those cannot be in there. So, pop that backup washer in, find where my oil holes are. Here's this one. I need to align that with this one. And with everything nice and clean, those halves just slide right together, just like that. Kind of a lot of work, but I've got a good center bearing housing slash one-way clutch assembly now for X231. Well guys, I know I started out the video by saying that I wanted to finalize the installation of both the main transmission shafts, but unfortunately I had to get so deep into this thing with X231's original housing being so bad that it just drug on and on and on and I can tell 
it's getting about time to wrap the video up right here. So we'll start the next one out by getting that housing put in there, and then we'll start getting these transmission shafts hopefully adjusted and finally where they need to be. And I know I ended up talking quite a bit in this one, but that one-way clutch slash bearing housing assembly has so much to do with both the upper transmission shaft and the torque amplifier that I just kind of had to kind of go in between both of those assemblies and kind of get into how that worked. And at least it gave me a chance to really get into the thing and break it down and, and just kind of show everybody what's in there and how it's supposed to work when it's all in good shape. So anyway, guys, stay tuned. I'm going to keep throwing parts in this thing and hope to see you back again. Thanks for watching.